Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort, this time with Tope Awatana, the uh, founder and CEO of Calendly, which I'm excited about because I am a Calendly user. And uh, you know, over the past few months, started using uh, the software and the app, and I was like, wow, I got to have this guy on. So that's not always the way it happens, but I'm happy to say it happened that way this time. Tope, uh, thanks. I'll start off with you the same way I always start, which is to ask, what's the toughest problem either as a founder CEO or um, just in general that you're solving for these days? Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, the, you know, the toughest problem we're solving right now at Calendly is hiring, right? So we're in a business that's experiencing a lot of growth. Uh, we are creating a category that in spite of all of our success, is still very much nascent. The vast majority of people who need our product um, are still on the sidelines. And the only, uh, the biggest blocker between getting those people using our product and, um, and realizing the value that we offer is, um, is people being able to hire. Uh, so I still have to say hiring is the biggest challenge that we are, that we face, just getting everything from, you know, product people to engineers, to sales people, to marketing people, getting them in as fast as, uh, as we can and really making sure that they're, they're the best and brightest and also that they, uh, that their values align with ours. Those are the, uh, that's the toughest problem that we're facing. So I got, I got to let people know what Calendly is for the uninitiated. Uh, and it, it's kind of like, it works for me like a personal assistant would. Um, you, it, it allows people to schedule time on my calendar uh, for meetings, for Fort Knox one-on-one -on -one streams, whatever it might be, with minimal back and forth. And the way I became uh, aware of this, um, you know, months ago, I had Stephen Wolf Pereira, the, the CEO of Encantos on, and he uses it, right? And he would, all the time, he'd just be like, oh, let's talk, schedule some time on my calendar. And he would send me this Calendly link, and I'd click on it, and I'd see his calendar and these 15 or 30-minute blocks, and I could just pick the time that worked for me, and it would go into his calendar, and I would get an email, and it's like, whoa, this is... This is kind of cool. This is kind of easy. And then I thought, why am I not doing this? Because there were so many meetings that I wasn't taking just because I couldn't deal with the hassle of, oh, I want an hour in your schedule. What days are you available? And I send them three or four days and then they send me back three or four days. And oh, I can do that time. I can't do that time. It's like I was just going, you know, I'd like to talk to you, but I don't have time to think about that right now. So we'd never end up meeting. But Calendly solved that problem for me. So that's that's my take on Calendly. Um how are you guys, uh, I, I think, raised some money at a $3 billion valuation earlier this year. Um, what are you doing with that? And what are the problems that you're solving next? Yeah, so uh, I think you described Conley really well. Um, the, the one thing I'll just add to that is, yes, the, the most obvious uh, you know, uh, benefit of Conley is the, you know, reducing the back and forth of uh, finding the time to meet. But what we also do is after the meeting is scheduled, we help to automate, you know, preparation and follow up of that meeting. So really making sure, you know, data is pushed into other systems and you know, the right people are notified, agendas are created, all those things. It runs uh, the gamut depending on, uh, you know, the, our users or, and the industries that they work in. Uh, but you're right, also right about us raising at a $3 billion valuation not too long ago. Um, you know, the things, the problems that we're solving are the same problems we were solving before we raised that round. Uh, the, the business actually has been profitable for many years. Uh, but what that round allows us to do is just further invest in growth. Like I said, uh, for all of our success, um, you know, if you look at the addressable market, the number of people who can benefit from the service that we're offering, um, the vast majority of them are still on the sidelines, just like you were not too long ago. And so uh, we're looking for uh, using that capital to, to do th three things, to accelerate product innovation. How do you hire, you know, the best product people and the best engineers? And um, how do you expand your, uh, your marketing and your go to market, right? How do you get more, get the word out, not just about the product, but also, you know, we're in this position where we're creating not just a product, but we're also bringing awareness to the problem. Today, it's not well understood how the inefficiencies of meetings are really uh, creating, um, you know, causing lost productivity and lost revenue and, uh, you know, um, employee dissatisfaction. And so making right. people aware of the the, uh, the value that we provide and also bringing awareness of the problem today, uh, those are some of the things that we're doing. And, and, and then opportunistically over time, and I, you know, we'll find 
other ideas to uh, uh, other ways to better serve our users and uh, being a, having that massive war chest will allow us to do so. Who's paying you uh, at this stage? Because you've got different tiers of service depending on how many calendars you want to connect to and you know, sort of different, you talked about data pushing to different systems, depending on how many of those pushes and services you want, you can pay different amounts. Um, you know, you used to be in sales, uh, you know, focused there. Is that um, sort of a primary premium use case? What are you seeing? Yeah, really good question. So I'll say the, the people who use Calendly are those people who are in external facing roles that schedule you know, multiple meetings weekly. So um, a lot of people fit into that category. It's everything from a freelancer, right, who is, you know, maybe running a consulting business to a teacher who's scheduling parent-teacher hours, uh, uh, sorry, parent-teacher parent conferences with, with families and children to professors who are offering office hours to salespeople who are uh, connecting with prospective customers to customer service people who are engaging with their existing customers. So um, the people who uh, use Calendly, you know, um, you know, sp you know span uh, just you know span the gamut. Um, in addition, so you have so you have those individuals who are using the product, um, but we also have teams and large organizations that are using it. So you may have an individual who's a uh, who's running their own, who's a solo partner, uh, a solo entrepreneur that's running their own business. You also have individuals within large teams. Um, furthermore, you then have teams that are using it together, right? So imagine you have a team of 300 customer service people who wanna present their availability to prospective customers. Um, they're also using the product to, uh, to help automate the distribution of those meetings based on rules for uh, availability or who's best to, to serve that customer. So just it spans the gamut. It also spans many different industries, everything from retail to higher education, to technology, to financial services. So that's a lot of people scheduling time with people. What about people scheduling time with places, uh, conference rooms, now uh, workspaces? Is that something that, that fits in your mandate? Uh, in this current phase of our growth, we're mostly focused on uh, uh, the scheduling of people, the scheduling of meetings between people. Um, you know, you know, resources and um, and you know and uh, devices is not something that we're. There are people who use Calendly for that use case, but I wouldn't say that's uh, you know really what we built the product for in mind. But um, I think that's just a really good example of um, all of the other problems that we uh, that we want to solve that we haven't gotten to just yet. Uh, tell me about your uh, geographical location. Um, where I believe you're in Atlanta. Um, how has that played into your growth, uh, the culture of the company, particularly over the past 18 months, coming up on two years of a pandemic? Yeah, so um, I'm actually in Florida now, I, <laughs> right this second, but I, you know, Atlanta, is, uh, uh, Atlanta is indeed where the company got its start. And, uh, you know, fast forward, so the company started in Atlanta in 2013. And um, fast forward to today, we have about over 300 employees. And um, there is a strong concentration of those employees in Atlanta. Uh, but in the pandemic, we became a remote first company. It's actually been a, uh, a game changer for us in terms of, you know, uh, being able to retain our employees as their personal circumstances change and also allows us to uh, tap into a, uh, a national uh, pool for talent. Uh, what Atlanta has done for us is, um, um, it, you know, I think that, you know, starting a company in Atlanta, as opposed to some of the you know, typical tech hubs, the most popular tech hubs, whether they're San Francisco or New York, what, a lot of, what a lot of Atlanta did for us is, you know, the cost of living in Atlanta is a lot cheaper than um, than the West Coast or uh, in the Northeast. And so what that allowed us to do is really build a uh, capital efficiency, uh, a capital efficient business. Um, and um, yeah, so that's been the benefit of uh, uh, starting the company in Atlanta. But as we've grown and scaled, um, you know, we've, you know, we've become a national company because we need uh, all the, uh, as many people as we can to join this mission of uh, serving our customers. Uh, there. Tell me about the remote first aspect of retention during this time. What, what anecdotally were you finding with the workforce and what people wanted or needed to do? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, I, I think the, the data point that I think uh, tells the story the best is that since the pandemic started, 20% of our employees have moved to completely different states, right? And in a world in which we had remote uh, remained a, um, 
just in Atlanta, um, 20% of our employees would have left the company simply because their personal cir- circumstances uh, changed. And so by, um, you know, by transitioning into a remote uh, first, uh, uh, to a remote first approach, we've been able to retain those people and uh, also uh, hire people that, you know, a year or two ago would have, you know, that would have wanted to join um, Cali, but wouldn't have been able to because the our location would have been prohibitive uh, um, for them. So even, I mean, even Atlanta was prohibitive. It, it seems like one of those places where people are like, whew, it's not San Francisco, right? Like, or, or it's not New York. Um, what, what sorts of either blowback or resistance were you, were you getting? Where are people... Uh, where are you hiring people that they are able to stay, whereas before you would have wanted them to move to Atlanta? Uh, so I'm not sure I understand that question. Are you saying where are we now able to hire people that we weren't able to hire before? Yeah, um, because Atlanta doesn't come to mind as like the super expensive tech hub that people are like. like right now, people are trying to flee San Francisco and go to Austin and like go to Atlanta. So <laughs> it seems to me. Um, so so tell me more about how that how this helped you and where you've got employees located now who would have found a move um, to you know your previous like headquarters uh, location prohibitive. Yeah. So I think you know the to back up a little bit. One of the things we see is that you know certain types of skills or talents are more abundant in certain parts of the country than the other. Right. So let's take, you know, the building software companies, for example, Atlanta has a lot of great and successful tech companies and software companies. But the business models of those of the companies that have done well in Atlanta have mostly been traditional uh, business to business, B2B software companies. Right. Calendly has taken a slightly different approach. We are building products for you know, business individuals, but the way we distribute the product and what we build it looks more like a consumer company. And um, so, you know, there's an acronym PLG, product-led growth. That's the approach that we take. And there are not a lot of people in Atlanta. There are not a lot of product-led growth companies that have, uh, you know, uh, successfully scaled in Atlanta. And so when you get into uh, the hundreds of millions of users and you're dealing, you know, and you need to scale the business, there's just not that many people who have done it at scale in Atlanta. And so you need to go out to places like San Francisco to get those people to come to Atlanta. And then the calculation that those people used to make before, uh, we became a remote first company is I love Calendly. I'm bought into Calendly, but what if I move my entire life, my family to Atlanta and for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. Uh, what other company in Atlanta can I work for? And so while right. Atlanta itself is not, you know, it's a great city. They would love to be in Atlanta. The calculation they're making is if for whatever reason, it doesn't work for me, where else can I work there? And that becomes a, um, that becomes difficult to convince people. Say I say all that to say we are now, you know, before the pandemic, 95% or so of our employees were based in Atlanta. Fast forward to today, it's probably something like 70% uh, or Interesting. Yeah. So uh, what, I, what I love about that insight is it's the flip side of what some people are saying about fleeing cities. Um, you know, I, I think that there are still certain tech hubs, whether it's, you know, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Austin, et cetera. Part of the draw there is not just uh, the cost of living is low and I have a job, but there's other people I can meet. There's other places I can go. There are ways that I can grow, right? And your top talent is probably thinking about that as much as they're thinking about, you know, what's my mortgage going to be, right? Exactly. Top people are in demand. That's part of what you're saying, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so now we are hiring those people who were who you know, live in San Francisco and would have never wanted to uh, come to Atlanta for you know, reasons other than Calendly. Now we're able to attract those people. And by the way, some of those people, as we make the offer to them, they also tell us, by the way, I'm in San Francisco now, but next month I'm moving to Minnesota. That's a real example right. <laughs> that happened. So um, what's happening is, I mean, I think a lot of people are really trying to figure out what their new normal as, uh, as the world is changing around us and they want utmost flexibility. We believe in that, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we want to uh, be able to support uh, them. Yeah. Okay. So we learned a bit about Calendly and the, the situation, uh, the challenge of, of growing a startup in this environment. I want to learn a bit uh, about you personally and start at the very beginning, as I like to. Um, where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, siblings. Yeah, I was born in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. Um, um, I was born to a family uh, where my dad was a microbiologist and my mom was a pharmacist. 
and then I have um, you know four siblings. So you know from a you know from a from day one I was born into uh, I guess you could say a, a scientific family, and so <laughs> they kind of nudged me in that direction. And you know, uh, twenty years later on, or whenever I start, eighteen years later on, seventeen years later on, when I started college, I naturally uh, studied computer science. Um, but yeah, I, you know, could not be, I feel really, really lucky for the family that I was born into. Just, um, I love the, the values that they, uh, uh, they imparted on me. And, uh, you know, I look at where Calendly is today and I'm, um, I think it started in those early days. Uh, so tell me about growing up in Lagos. Um, you know, when you grew up in Lagos, you know, it's as it, <laughs> when you grew up in any part of the world, it's, it's your world. And so you don't think anything of it. Um, but I think what gave me the best appreciation for the, you know, for Lagos is moving to the States. Um, you know, in the time, you know, in the, in the, in the eighties, when I was born and, you know, through the early two thousands, there was just a lot of political instability in Nigeria. And it's still, you know, it's kind of much better than, uh, than what it was before, but, it's, uh, it was pretty bad then. And so the country was just chaotic and, um, I think that how does that but how does that look to a kid right like I know I know, you know me growing up in the 80s in bed you know Brooklyn it was kind of unstable too right but, but I also rem I remember the music of the time I remember you know my, the the church that my dad was pastoring the backyard barbecues things like that what what was the flavor of that growing up for you I mean I'll give you an example I can I can give you many many different examples um, I remember waking up one birthday, I could, you know, we can probably do a Google search and figure out what year it was. And my parents were, uh, in the living room listening to the radio because they'd been a coup. Right. Um, so yeah, that kind of instability. Um, and you know, I learned the word coup, at whatever, whatever age that was, um, until like the people would come and dare the TV. So there was no T, you know, the national uh, TV wasn't broadcast. And uh, so that's one example, you know, there have been, you know, I can, you know, there are also some tragic moments in my life because of that in instability. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, you don't, at least I didn't think of it as uh, instability. I just, it was the life as I knew it. Right. Last, now as an entrepreneur, um, I, I think what it, what it, uh, what it gave me is just agility, right? Um, you know, things will change all the time and just be prepared and just roll with the punches and uh, do the best you can to move forward and not linger, uh, not d don't dwell on what didn't happen or uh, what it once was. And right. Uh, yeah. So where are you in the birth order? Uh, third of four boys. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, you, you have to be scrappy, I take it. Yeah, so I got beat up by my two older brothers a lot. That makes you tough. <laughs> and um, obviously, I, uh, you know, I share some of that with my younger brother. And <laughs> right, so you're all tough. Yeah. Uh, and so, what were you into w with your free time, with your spare time, or even like favorite subjects in school? What were what were you focused on? Yeah, I was always really, um, you know, my hobbies as a kid, I, you know, growing up, I thought I, I wanted to be a soccer player. I wasn't really good at all, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was one of my favorite hobbies. Um, but in school, I did, I did well with the sciences. So I was really good at math, really good at uh, um, physics. It took me a while to fall in love with chemistry, but eventually I became good, uh, you know, I became a decent uh, chemistry, chemistry uh, student as well. And um Early on, my parents, you know, you know, uh, they they put me in a gifted uh, kids uh, program, so they, I guess, I was doing well, and they, I could take this test that allowed me to skip a few grades. So uh, that also shaped me a, a few lot. grades, <laughs> two grades specifically. That's that's uh, still a lot. Well, how old were you when you skipped two grades? Um, I don't remember, um, but it would have been around, uh, maybe right around the equivalent of middle school. Um, um, over there. So does that mean you're you're going to high school um, with teenagers before you're a teenager? You're kind of yeah. It meant that my classmates were two years older than me, right? As a matter of fact, I uh, I graduated high school at 15. Um, the, well, the equivalent of a high school major, and I got admitted into college here at 15. Uh, my mom would not let me start college at 15. She thought I was too young. I uh, I disagreed at the time, but I think it's one of the best decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so how does that play out if you're if you're you know 12 13 14 15 in high school are you socially advanced to the point where that's fine and your friends are 17 18 and 
you know, the girls are 17, 18, and that's just fine, and, you know, the guys, or, or is that, you know, you're just so focused on the academic piece that the social piece maybe needs that couple years that your mom held you back to catch up? Uh, <laughs> so my mom uh, was a really, really uh, strict uh, person. And so like I, would <laughs> as soon as school was over, I went home and I stayed home and I played in the neighborhood or with my neighborhood kids, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't uh, allowed to go to parties with my, uh, uh, with my school friends. Um, I think what it just gave me is just, um, I had to rely on, I, 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 you know, I had to rely on, you know, charisma, maybe a little bit of a sense of humor to, you know, become friends with, you know, to people who are two years older than me and not, and not uh, get bullied. Um, Cause it would have been just, it would have been easy to do that. But, you know, that wasn't my case. Cause I think I, um, long story short, it allowed me to, it de- allowed me to develop all their other uh, skills, maybe a little bit of a, a sense of humor, if you will. Right. I'm sure, I'm sure your, your brother's uh, training uh, allowed you to be skilled in, in bully avoidance as well. Uh, that probably helped, right? Or, or, you know, or be a little proactive yourself. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, yes. Uh, so what, what happened in those, was it two years? Was it one year in between finishing high school and you coming um, west to college? Yeah, so I, um, I finished high school at 15 in Nigeria. At, that was 96. And then that same year, my family moved to the States. And so I then started high school in the U.S. And so I went to high school for two years in the U.S., even though I'd finished high school in Nigeria. Um, and so that was, um, it was the <laughs> easiest two years of my life. Uh, but more importantly, I think it really allowed me to uh, assimilate and I, uh, you know, learned a lot about American culture and American history uh, in that time. And um, um, I think it also allowed me to solidify what I wanted to um, um, pursue in college. So is this mid late nineties that you were, and did you move to, uh, to Georgia? Where did you guys move to? Yeah. So we moved to Atlanta in 1996 and, you know, like a lot of immigrant families, you pick a city because that's where you have, uh, you know, uh, family ties. My aunt lived in uh, Marietta, Georgia. And so that's where we, we moved to uh, live there for uh, two years and then went to college at uh, University of Georgia, Georgia and Athens uh, starting in 98. Um, you, you say you learned a lot about America. There were a few things going on at that time. I think Olympic Park uh, bombing, Unabomber stuff, uh, also the OJ trial around 95, 96 uh, time period. What, what do you remember from that time? Yes, uh, man, I remember uh, a lot. So I remember the OJ trial, but I think I was fo- I was following that before we moved here. So we had you know satellite TV back there, and so you know uh, I watched soccer. I also watched a lot of <laughs> well, a lot of world news, and you know that was definitely a story that captivated uh, um, uh, the news at the time. I think the interesting thing for me when I moved to the to the states was um, I mean so many many different things. Um, you know, small things like um, you know, I'd been to the States many times before, but you, there's a difference between coming to a place and visiting it for a month as, and as opposed to living um, in it, um, you know, being a, a resident of that state. Um, <laughs> it sounds silly now, but when I first, you know, living in Atlanta, it took me a while to really understand the Southern accent, right? So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so that was just a, a small thing. People would say things I just didn't understand what they were saying. Um, and I felt like, the, you know, at times it was a different language, but, you know, Fast forward to now, I, I use y'all more than uh, anybody else. <laughs> um, there was that. There was, you know, I think the, you know, the notice in African culture, Nigerian culture, there's a heavy emphasis on, on, um, on, on, on family and community. There, there is here too, but I think Americans also, um, Americans are comfortable with standing out uh, more than I'd say um you know in some ways more so than um you know nigerians are so there's just you know small little things like that that i uh thought were um interesting so what do you comfortable with standing out what what do you mean and how did uh, i mean i guess you learned to stand out uh because you're the founder and ceo of a company now so how did that play out yeah so i mean i i mean um i guess maybe the the Maybe the best example to share is, is I think when people are, you know, if you <laughs> if you pull out the um, anyway, 
if you take people who are really, really successful in Nigeria, right, the, let's say the top 1% of Nigeria, I think they, um, they're they probably more charitable, uh, you know, relative to their means. And I think maybe, um, uh, you know, then maybe with their counterparts are here, things like that, right? Um, where people, if they've, if they've done real, they just feel this um, responsibility to really help out their, their family and their community. I think some of that is also because uh, Nigeria probably doesn't have the same, you know, um, social safety net that, you know, uh, that maybe the U.S. has. So I think there are things like that um, that I just found to be a little bit different. Makes sense. Um, uh, tell me about uh, going into information systems, computer science, you, you say, and then why you, you went into sales uh, eventually. Yeah. Um, in the 90s, um, I became obsessed with the Internet and, uh, you know, and, and Windows 95 in general. So I just saw people, one, in the 90s, I was, like I said, I was a huge soccer fan. And so the way I could, you know, follow soccer all the time was on the on the internet, and open themselves to buy uh, Windows ninety five, and at the time Bill Gates was either was one of the richest people in the world or uh, might have been the richest person in the world, and you know those things got grabbed my attention, <laughs> and so it seems like you know in my you know narrow my you know in my simple teenage mind. I thought, you know, there must be something to, to, uh, to tech and computers. And so I wanted to be in computer science. And so go to, to the University of Georgia for computer science. And I did that for the first two years. I enjoyed it. It was really, really rewarding to, um, to write code and be able to build something from scratch. I really enjoyed the satisfaction that gave me. But one of the things I struggled with two years into being in the computer science program is that it was incredibly monotonous being behind a computer all day long and included. And um, I didn't really, I didn't like that. But I hadn't made a decision about what to do there, but I just knew that, you know, that part was, uh, you know, not as fun as I liked. And also, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and also when I look at the people who are in the computer science program, you know, probably different, right? Uh, in terms of, you know, interests than, um, um, than I was at the time, right? Um, and, you know, as a, you know, seven, you know, 18, 19 year old, those things matter to you more than they should. Matter. When you say, when you say interest, what do you mean? Um, sci-fi video games. I wasn't really into those things. I'm still not really into those things. Right. So, <laughs> um, in RPG, right. You know, I just wasn't into those things. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was different for me. Uh, and then the other thing was, at the end of my junior year, sorry, my sophomore year, I took a job uh, doing door-to-door -door sales. I was selling alarm systems. And that ended up changing my um, my view in a way that I could have never predicted. Hmm. Right? What happened when I did door-to-door -door sales is I just saw this very, I saw basically like a, a massive, and I, I saw this very predictable game, right? Is if you did, if you did, the right things and you did X, if you knock on X amount of doors, you would yield X amount of, you know, cash. And so I saw this very direct um, ability to one influence uh, my pay and I could, and if I improve my performance, if I either knock on more doors or I, or I you know, did better uh, with each, you know, sales call that I made, I saw this direct ability to just influence my earnings and um, that really fascinated me. So did you, did you hack the process? Because uh, I, I, you know, Michael Dell tells a story about how he was selling newspaper subscriptions a, a, as a kid and figured out uh, that mar people who are just married tended to buy homes and subscribe to newspapers. And, you know, he made a bunch of money that way. And it seems that, you know, the entrepreneurial mind when approaching sales tends to start figuring things out. I, and I wonder if that happened for you at all. I wouldn't say at that point that I hacked the process. Um, um, but I certainly, I, I saw the math equation for how it worked. Um, and so that was fascinating to me. The other thing that was fascinating to me was that I am, um, um, I'm extroverted, right? And, in, in <laughs> well, I have my introverted moments at times uh, too, but I saw the ability to, I saw, I got energy from interacting with people and, and spending time with them and persuading them to make you know, decisions that, you know, ended up uh, securing their family. 
And so I like that too, but I still wanted to be in tech. I still believe that tech is where the world was moving. And so coming out of college, I wanted to be able to find a way to, com uh, sorry, combine my, the, you know, my extroverted side with just a belief that tech is the place to be. And I ended up in enterprise software sales. And you did that until, um, you know, a few years ago, seven, eight years ago. What inspired the creation of Calendly? Yeah, um, I was working at EMC, looking to schedule a meeting. And um, at the time, I was selling to EMC's Fortune 500 companies, so other large companies themselves. And um, what that meant was if you try to arrange a meeting, you had to find a way to bring 20 people together, right? Which is um, bringing two people together is uh, painful. 20 people is probably 100 times more painful. And so that was, um, you know, that was frustrating. And I just wanted to find something that was already um, commercially available that I could use to solve this problem. Nothing great existed. And what I did see was, at least nothing great in my opinion, what I did see was there were a number of scheduling products on the market. And I thought they'd, you know, I thought they'd done a decent job. And some of it, I thought they'd done a decent job. But at the end of the day, I thought that they were approaching the problem in a very narrow way. And I thought there was a much bigger opportunity. And so, to summarize it, at the time, the scheduling products on the market had really built their products for the, the productivity geeks of the world, the most motivated people. I thought there was a bigger opportunity in solving it um, for, for the masses, the people who are not productivity geeks, just the everyday, just the everyday, uh, the everyday person. Now, you still have to appeal to the productivity geeks, but I thought, I thought I would, th there needed to be a product that prioritized the needs of the, the everyday person. And... Um, and you know, I had started a number of different businesses on the side, you know, nights and weekends, and four of them had failed at that point. So I was reluctant to actually start another business, and I wanted to be really, really um, uh, deliberate. And so I took two, six months to study the problem and really figure out what would be my unique um, angle to enter the um, the market. And I actually spent six months trying to find reasons not to do it. But at the end of the six months, uh, every sign wanted to uh, to do it, and uh, I ended up doing all the things they tell you not to do. I rated my 401k. Uh, I don't recommend that for, <laughs> for most people, uh, but that is what I did, and um, hired a team of engineers, and uh, um, the rest is history. Uh, there was there was a question uh, about that, and there's another question here. Uh, how do you build a moat against Google, Google Calendar copying this? Actually, I think somebody at Google told me that uh, originally they had tried to build something like this in, but then eventually uh, abandoned it. How, how did you look at that possibility? Yeah, listen, I think Google has some scheduling capabilities today, and, and there's no doubt in my mind they'll, they'll do more to solve scheduling. I think the difference between Calendly and... Uh, so well, Calendly is not a competitor to Google. I think at the end of the day... Um, Google account, Google wants uh, to be able to extend, uh, wants its users to get maximum value out of it, the calendar, and we help them do that. So that's one. But um, the other difference is that we have a much more complete vision for what scheduling could be, right? We don't have to think about search. We don't have to think about ads. We don't have to think about all these different things. We just maniacally focus on how do you create the best scheduling product for, um, for individuals, for teams, for organizations, and I think because of that, we can build um, a much more complete product. And uh, ultimately, uh, customers, all things equal, customers will pick the best product. And so what we have to do is just make sure that we, our product is more complete and solves more uh, problems um, related to scheduling and uh, the things that happen before, during, and after scheduling. And I think we'll be, we'll be great there. You started to get to this, but um, at what point, you know, Taj's question, did you have assistance with a startup cost or was it out of pocket? You said you rated your 401k, but at what point did you uh, actually raise money and how does that affect, um, you know, your ownership structure now? Yeah, so um, I did, yes, I bootstrapped the company with my own, uh, with uh, my 401k, but I ran out of money. <laughs> um, and um, so that was late 20, the, launched the product in late 2013 and by the time I launched the product, I'd actually run out of money. And so fast forward to uh, early 2014, I got connected with uh, an investor, um, a guy named David Cummins. He'd been a serial, a very successful entrepreneur himself. He just sold a business to, um, to uh, 
exact target in Salesforce and Turn for 100 million. And so I was reluctant to take funding because I, you know, I started the business in the, you know, in the riskiest way possible. Um, but I got connected with him and I saw him as a, not only a source of capital, but just a, um, a great um, advisor. And um, so I ended up raising um, a round from him of 350,000 in early 2014. And that's really all the company had uh, raised until uh, the $350 million raise in um, uh, earlier this year. Wow, so you went from 350,000 to 350 million, just. Right, the 350 worked the first time, so. <laughs> right. To, yeah, yeah. Why mess with it? Just yeah. add some zeros. Um, I, I always like to get to the question of uh, your lowest point. Uh, could be career-wise, could be uh, life-wise, because I think there are a lot of lessons yeah. there and how you get through it. But uh, I call it Death Valley. Uh, do you have a moment like that where you thought your plans, your potential, whatever it was, is hitting a wall and you were just going to have to upend it, start over, do something completely different? Yeah, so Calendly really from day one, you know, I, like I said, I started four businesses before Calendly and, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't go well. Calendly from day one took off, right? Um, and so what that meant is you don't have any time to think about whether it's going to, I never had any time to think about whether it was going to fail because it was, there was always a lot to do. There was always, you know, yeah, there was always so much to do. So there's no time to actually, <laughs> there's no moment like that. There were many, there were moments where I, I, um, I myself, in spite of the you know the success that the business was having, I, I myself myself felt um, stretched thin. Right? It was just uh, so. Then, what was the what was the most difficult business failure before Calendly? Um, I think so. I started this uh, business called ProjectorSpot.com. That was probably the most difficult because it was the first one, and I think I put like you know thirty k into it. Um, but it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that difficult. I, I, a few months later after that, I started another business. So I didn't really, the failures that happened before, yes, they were you know, disappointing because you, you know, because you obviously have a lot of uh, um, hopes for the idea you would never pursue it, uh, but it wasn't incredibly demoralizing. As a matter of fact, I, I credit the fact that I'm talking to you, that I'm talking to you today to the fact that um, in some ways, in a lot of ways, I had a short memory with those, uh, about those failures. So tell me about resilience then, because you referred to this earlier, the growing up, the instability in the overall environment and personal losses uh, connected to it. And clearly you, might have, you must have had to bounce back from those. What was the, the biggest one that you can remember? The biggest, uh, sorry. Uh, loss or, you know, a disruption that you had to bounce back from. Uh, man, um, you know, lost both of my parents. Um, you know, lost my dad at 12, lost my mom as I was starting Calendly. Um, both of those were incredibly difficult. And, um, and, and, you know, in a lot of ways, Calendly was a, um, helped me to deal with that distraction. And so I see all that to say, like, you know, when you, when you can, you know, you know lose the people that matter to you the, the most in life, it just makes you realize that any of the challenge is trivial compared to that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me about um, what, where did you go, uh, either you know, physically, location-wise, or, or people-wise, to heal, to reflect, to, um, to be able to go forward from those kinds of devastating losses? Yeah, I mean, I think what I did is maybe not necessarily what I think uh, <laughs> um, I would recommend that anyone do. But for me, like what I did, you know, when my dad died, I was 12, so I don't know that I you know, knew what to do. And you know, I think Nigeria is different in terms of how people handle grief in here, you know, like, you know, there are no therapists. I, I didn't know what a therapist was when I was uh, until I got to the states. Um, but what I did in 2013 when my mom died is I just poured my soul into Calendly. That's what you know. It was my. It was my. Uh, uh, that was my respite from the um, from the loss. And um, I don't know that that's what you know the best thing for most people to do, but that worked for me. Um, and so now uh, you talked about some of the hurdles that you've gone through, gotten over in the process of, you know, raising and growing and adjusting to the conditions for the company. We started off talking about the pandemic and the need to be flexible with employees. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I was talking to uh, Ariel Cohen um, for the CEO of Trip Actions and kind of hitting on the same uh, idea and theme of get, getting through difficult moments, difficult times uh, as a leader. 
uh, how do you do it now? How do you manage for it when somebody else who you're working with, who's working for you, is having a difficult time and maybe their team needs to adjust or you need to adjust? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of kind of what I just shared is I think that, you know, when I look at when I look at the, you know, minus the, you know, like the, the, the losses of the, you know, like my, uh, my parents, when I look at most of the problems that I faced in life, the difficult ones, whether it was the failure of the different businesses or a point where you lost a, a big deal that you were working on. I think what I found is at the moment, everything feels like the world is coming to an end. Right. But when I look at it, every single one of those now, they look so silly, like in hindsight. Right. Because the reality is at the, you know, in that moment, it feels, you know, it feels like you just can't move uh, past it. But when you, you know, when you have the, you know, the, uh, the advantage of, uh, you know, three, four years after, the, it just looks trivial. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the early days of Conley, the first hire that I made left, decided that, you know, we just, you know, we weren't, it was my first CTO, it just wasn't working. And at the time, it felt like the business was going to end, right? Um, but it's a, you know, it's a blip in the radar. He's gone on to do great things. Callan has done, gone on to do great things. Like it didn't, in the grand scheme of things, it didn't stunt the business, uh, the business's growth at any point. So I think that's the, that's the, um, I guess the perspective that I, that I, that I just shared is um, think about the long term. You know, what's happened now, we can't go back and fix it. Um, but let's focus on how we move forward and also realize that it feels really, really difficult now. But if we look back, a year from now, we're gonna. This is gonna look silly that we even, you know, uh, stayed up thinking about this. Well, that speaks to perspective, and maybe is knocking on the door of the the follow up question that I always ask about what got you through those difficult moments. Is there a core belief, a tool in your toolbox now that you can kind of take out as a leader uh, and use? Does it have to do with uh, with that piece you just mentioned? Absolutely. All right. Well, that's the quickest. Uh, core belief part that we all had to go through. And I'll, I'll finish up just by asking, um, right now, the way I use Calendly, at least, uh, it, it's a lot of one scheduling, one-on-one -on -one scheduling, right? But you mentioned group scheduling be a part of it. I imagine, you know, making it easier for, say, personal assistants to schedule for other people. Uh, there are probably ways that you could do that. Vision-wise, where do you go from here? I mean, there are so many different things, but I think you you uh, you hit on some of them. Some of them, and I can try to outline uh, just a few highlights. One is I think um, Calendly is definitely very strong in one-to-one -one meetings today, but then um, there are many many-to-many many meetings, and uh, that is an area in which we're focused on. And as a matter of fact, we uh, will be releasing uh, a few features uh, related to that uh, in the not too distant future. All uh, right. But but um, many to many meetings and also um, allowing uh, and also uh, those meetings that just, you know, involve uh, collaboration with many internal people and also external people. They may not be schedulers themselves, but also uh, just other participants in the meeting process, bringing those people uh, uh, into simplifying you know, the experience of those people. So that's one. Uh, also simplifying meetings in general. So adding more. Uh, capabilities before meetings, during meetings, and after meetings. Some of those will be native uh, capabilities that, we'll, that we build. Some of those will just be integrated into best of cl class platforms and bringing the, those capabilities uh, closer to Calendly. Um, we want to be able to provide our users more insights on, on, um, on their usage of Calendly and how that's driving, um, uh, you know, driving the most important outcome for them. More importantly, in the future, we also want to be able to help them make make recommendations to them about the optimal way to use Calendly to achieve the outcomes they want. Um, those are some of the big ones, and uh, I guess maybe you know, you know uh, the final one is uh, un unlocking the enterprise opportunity. So, uh, in the enterprise, the enterprise segment is one of our fastest growing segments, um, and that's to, um, because of some deliberate investment and effort there, and we want to continue that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you got to get behind the firewall because uh, I tell you, like, I recommend Calendly to people. And, you know, sometimes like I, I schedule my stuff outside of my work calendar, our NBC universal kind of uh, work calendar. And uh, but, you know, people have to ask IT to get permissions to hook it. it. It's a pain. So you fix that. You know, I'm telling a bunch of people we're telling a bunch of people. So that is uh, that is true. 
Uh, Tope, I appreciate it. Uh, you sharing about Calendly, a bit about yourself. Thanks for uh, being with me on Fort Knox. Thanks so much for having me.